Um, my name is Una Frawley. I'm an associate professor here in the English department. We're delighted to see so many of you here today. We're really grateful for the support. And it's great to see so many of you from outside of the university as well. We are absolutely thrilled to have um, our, our guests today um, here at Noose, um, hosted by one of our Kildare Arts writers in residence, um, the wonderful Fiona Scarlett, um, whom I will leave to introduce um, our distinguished guests. But just to say, a very warm welcome and thank you so much um, to both of our writers for being here today. It's a really wonderful occasion for us and I'm just so chuffed that I got to have them sign books. <laughs> so um, I'll sit down and let you get on with it, but a very warm welcome to Roddy Doyle and to Louise. Hi, everyone. First, we just want to know your faces out there, the new faces as well. And a big thank you to everyone who's here in the room today and also for those who are joining online and um, for our next working as a writer series with the phenomenal Roddy Doyle and Louise Kennedy. And Roddy Doyle is the author of 11 novels, two collections of stories, two books of dialogue and Rory Nita, a memoir of a pair. He has written eight books for children and has contributed to a variety of publications including The New Yorker, Maxini, Metro Air and several anthologies. He won the Booker Prize in 1993 for Paddy Clark's Ha Ha Ha. Roddy has also, has also written for stage. The adaptation of his novel, The Snapper, was produced at the Gate Theatre in Dublin in June 2019, and his play, Two Times, was at the Abbey Theatre. He wrote the book for the musical adaptation of his novel, The Commitment, which premiered in the Palace Theatre London in 2013. He translated Mozart's Don Giovanni in 2015 for Opera Theatre Company in Dublin. He has also written for the big and small screen. Screen plays include The Commitment, The Snapper, the van and for BBC family. He lives and works in Dublin. Louise Kennedy grew up in Hollywood in County Down and has exploded onto the literary scene with her short story collection, The End of the World is Hazy Sack, in 2021, which won the John McGavran Prize. Her debut novel, Press Passes, already has won Ethan's Novel of the Year at the Oliver's Book Awards, was shortlisted for the Walter Stone Debut Fiction Prize, the Barnes and Noble Discovery Prize and recently lauded for the Women's Prize for Fiction. She also has a PhD in creative writing from Queen's University Belfast, and before she started writing, she spent nearly 30 years working as a chef, and she lives in Sligo. So Louise and Roddy, a huge welcome to the Thank you. Um, just before we begin, Roddy, just let me even show you uh, the biography there. Um, I remember the family, I remember when that was on TV, and there was a neighbour of ours, a class, Barry Ward, as one of the young children in it. Uh, we were number five and Barry was number seven. And I just remember the huge excitement at the time uh, when he was uh, on the TV and also with uh, the commitment. My father, well, as the story goes, whether he did or he didn't, who knows, but he said that he auditioned for, he was a trumpet player, and he said he auditioned for the part of Joey Delitz and didn't get it. <laughs> so every time it was on, he used to be, like, he'd tell us that story and he'd be raging that he didn't get the part. <laughs> As far as I can make out, virtually every person who lives in Broadway yeah. and are obviously uh, staying around yeah. 1990, yeah. they're in the committee. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. The day that there's a, uh, I was in a book called I Can't Remember Which One, I think it's Dr. Shaw, but it's quite recently, it's like three years ago. I turned it on, it was really very, very tall, uh, young woman. And uh, she was over six foot, like I said, she was very tall, very strong. And she said, Are you Roddy Doyle? I said, I am, yeah. And she said, I was in the snapper. And I was thinking, well, she's very young to be in the snapper. I said, Who would you play? She said, The baby. <laughs> 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 so we're actually two babies. I didn't know. <laughs> And as this series is all about working as a writer and showing how writers can be a viable career prospect, I was wondering if the book could talk about um, your past publication. How did you get that first book published? <laughs> uh, so I didn't write, and I didn't have any, I mean, it just never occurred to me that I should write. I would have read a lot. Um, um, so it, I didn't like decide to start writing. So once one day in, it was like early January 2014, you know, it's the time of year when people like my job to learn music and join the evening classes and things. Uh, but I never did anything like that. Uh, maybe 
I think I maybe got this from the person who joined the thing. Um, I've also said because I worked as a chef, my hours were very antisocial. So I did, I used to work at night and I worked at the weekend. So it didn't really leave. I don't know by that stage I had two kids, so it didn't really leave any time for um, you know, for pastimes or, or leisure really. But a friend of mine had been asked to join um, a writing group, and she was a visual artist and was finding uh, she had two small kids as well, and she was finding it hard to get time to do that sort of work. And I think maybe she thought that maybe writing would be some kind of creative outlet for her or something, but she couldn't, you know, we was like big canvases with like a couple of men. He found a door around the house. So um, she had been asked to join this writing group and asked me to go along. And I uh, thought it was the hilarious thing I'd ever heard and I said no. And um, like it was that day that she'd asked me to go, she asked me a couple more times. And then uh, she turned up at my house. Uh, is this being recorded? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Um, uh, she turned up to my house and um, I basically said to the park. So I grabbed it. Um, I, I mean, I didn't even have a notebook really. Um, I had um, a book that I wrote like the rosters in for working at we had a restaurant at that stage that was like really dying to death. That's maybe another reason why I started writing it because I think things have to be very bad for me even to consider getting into the car with her to do something mad like that. Um, but I had like a notebook that I wrote like practice in and rosters and everything like, and, and a pen. Like I went with it. And at the first week, I made a complete show of myself and said, um, you know, somebody went around the room and asked everybody why they were there. They all had, you know, quite charming answers, like, you know, they had a chat book of poetry or something. And so I said, oh, here, because she made me come. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I don't know, I must be curious. So I uh, agreed. So I went back and I agreed to try and write a short story maybe five weeks later. So um, I don't know what happened to me. So I just have ever since been running away from my husband and children with a laptop trying to find time to get right. <laughs> Um, but I think so. Maybe really how I got uh, ended up in the book is because I was in a writing group. We were, you know, we each, I suppose, we, because there were eight of us, we would turn around for about eight weeks and you'd have to produce a new story every eight weeks. So, so that just meant that we were like, I was always writing. Mm -hmm. And um, then about a year later, because our restaurant uh, collapsed uh, and we ended up in the job, I um, was able to get funding uh, to do a master's in. Really writing in Queens, and then I got one for a PhD. Um, so that just meant that I was writing all the time. I, I started to submit to journal and uh, a few competitions, and uh, I had, you know, even to end up in a long list is very encouraging or anything. And um, then I had one particular story that was published in a Belfast based magazine uh, called the Tangerine, and it somehow ended up on the desk of a literary agent in uh, Dublin, uh, which I think is important for lots of reasons. You know, you think it really, really you know, kind of Irish journals that maybe nobody ever gets to see them, but they actually do. And there is, a, you know, great interest in, in Irish writing. So um, so that got me an agent. And then that same story got shortlisted for a big short story award. And based on that, then I had a, an insane kind of, I don't know, draft of a novel, but I fixed up 10,000 words. I also had about 12 short stories at that stage. So my agent was able to go out with that work then, yeah. yeah. But like, like trying to fix up the 10,000 words from the draft I had was ridiculous. Because um, I, so I thought it was fabulous, but I tried to be more than that. So I just like fixed up with the of prose. And uh, she usually would email me, but she, and, and say about an hour after I had said, she phoned me and said, um, the door didn't be very posh, it was people who said, mm, do you know what the chapter is? <laughs> yeah, I thought I started um, uh, when I was in university, started growing, but it's, it's never in any organized way, you know. But I got a job teaching when I was 21. And then the first summer holidays arrived. Um, she knew July and August. So I thought, well, I can start writing. And I decided I'd start writing the following day. So eventually, anyway, I got into the habit of popped on, I think, quite quickly. But if you want to write a novel, which I did, you have to do it on a regular basis, the same way that you read the book. So, so certainly not the case today. So I got into the habit of writing, particularly June, July, and August. I think it was 1982. And uh, a lot of the habits that I still have now about uh, my work routine date back to me. And I started then sending, I wrote what I called the composite novels. 
and I sent it off to the publishers and I didn't know anybody, you know. So I sent it off uh, to publishers and to their agents and was getting either rejection slips or nothing at all. About. So I then very quickly, something clicked when I started writing the book with the Committee in 1986. And I thought, this is what I want to do. This is what this is the previous stuff I now know. Um, it's what probably academics would call shite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty good. Commitments are just something thick. And I thought, well, I'll publish it myself. Mm. So that's what I did. And a mm. friend of mine found out how much it could cost, what we needed to do, and we published it ourselves uh, in 1987. Then I sent it off to English publishers. And one of them in particular, who, who was my publisher up until very recently, he retired. He was very, very keen. But it goes back so far that I was living in a bed set in Dublin. And the first time we spoke, he had written to me to say, I had sent him the phone number, the pay phone in the hall. <laughs> and he said he'd phone me at such and such a time on the 17th of June. So I was kind of in the bed set. Waiting for the phone to ring so I could let it down the stairs <laughs> and get to it before a guy who was in the flat nearest to it called to the phone would pick it up as he invariably did and said, No, he's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's before any sort of uh, mobile phone. Yeah. So that, anyway, by publishing it myself, that opened the door for me. Uh, but it's a long time ago. Yeah. So I think conditions are very different. Yeah, and I just think it's so important for people to see there's lots of different roads yeah. to get published. There is no one shoe that's all that you sometimes might think that you need to know people in publishing or all these different things. There's so many different routes and um, to get there. And what I think is interesting as well is for both of you, before you came to work on as a writer, you had a career well do yourself with teaching and leave yourself with the chef and, and is there anything from those careers that you think you Brought into your life. So, mm. um, I didn't know that teaching, but very, very little. Yeah. Not being really interested about writing by myself. But I suppose you know one thing I do have is that the routine of going to work, getting up, you know, the anxiety and yeah. all, getting the kids ready, charging out of the house. I remember with the teaching, making sure I had a jumper that didn't have baby cue going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, or if I'd been in the boat when I before, I'd have to smell of smoke. So yeah. I had a jumper, you know, a work jumper. <laughs> and I think it was they took uh, staff photographs at the end of, you know, the end of the epidemic year. And, you know, I think I was going to see the same jumper. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you, I a child of two, child two, and you know, two children. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, the routine of work, I think, is important. But having colleagues, yeah. you know, yeah. having colleagues, this is what writers we, we don't, which is actually the plus and the minus of yeah. being a writer by yourself. So, uh, an awful lot of um, just experiences, whether it's work or not, you bring it with you, not necessarily for correctly on the page, yeah. but it's hard, it, it's, it's stuff to dip into. Yeah. And you may fast and um, friends and colleagues, because I know my girls, um, teaching for a long time for um for the maze switch and um, i do i do miss that you're in a staff room or you're chatting away with people all the time you're sort of bouncing ideas off each other or if you're having a tough day you know you're able to chat through it and um, with them which is, it, which is a bit harder to do when you're writing do you think <laughs> <laughs> that's when you're going to see me bouncing an idea <laughs> 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 I want to be shifting then, Louise. Do you think any of that skill or knowledge that's happened that um, fed into your writing as well in any way? Um, well, I think that because of your chef, uh, the hours are pretty antisocial, and that could mean anything. You know, we can do breakfast shifts, it depends on how I get to weekends and stuff. And um, and you you know, you can cook for a split second on a Saturday when you're walking in to work at 10 o'clock, and you know you're not going to get out of there until midnight. And you know that there are going to be loads of people who all want to eat, you know, at the same time and um, put the spent money that they might not always be happy. Um, and you could start to feel really sorry for yourself, mm -hmm. but you just can't even entertain that. So I think that that may be helping with working with deadlines and stuff like that because mm -hmm. it's just such shit you know. Yeah. So I think that helps. Um, I don't know, like people have said to me that cooking is a creative practice, but maybe when I cooked in the beginning, in my 20s, it was, but um, I think with a lot of jobs, um, 
the higher up the ladder you go, the less it is about the reason you went into it in the first place. So I've spoken to lots of people who say, you know, I wanted to be this or I wanted to be that, and now I'm just a manager, and now I'm looking at spreadsheets all day or, or whatever. And, uh, and and I think that definitely happened. Like so definitely because we had our own restaurant, we were doing everything, and it, you know, it became a lot less about the things yeah. that I like like cooking. Yeah. You know? yeah. Did you make this at all? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I did the last yeah. in the kitchen. I know I'm way too old. Like, I did my last, like, my hips, like, I just couldn't. Um, yeah. I couldn't be doing that anymore. Yeah. I think I did my last shift in the kitchen about five years ago. Yeah. I think God was my last shift. Because I think I'd be too old to do it again. Mm -hmm. um, no, I mean, I think I really enjoyed it in my 20s and 30s yeah. and stuff, but it just got like, harder to later on. And then I think once I saw chemistry sets, I don't think it's in the kitchen, I realized I was like, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's Talk a bit more about such a accessibility and publishing and sort of breaking down barriers and showing that it's possible for anybody really who has an ambition or a dream to write and uh, to write. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about fighting words and a little bit about it and why you decided to set it up. Well, Fighting Words uh, Writing Centre, we're based um, in Russell Street, right opposite Grove Park. We've been open, the building has been open since uh, 2009. We've got centres around the country that are, you know, once or twice a week for, in case of health, I suppose, all the time. And uh, what we are is a writing centre for children and young people. And we try to make it as uh, inviting and as doable as possible. And um, uh, the reason I did it, I suppose when you're a teacher, it's like a congenital disorder in a way. You never know. You can always tell, you know, if you see the teachers when they're out, you can always tell it's a gang of teachers because they're trying to make each other sick. <laughs> you know, either alphabetical or in color code or something. But, I suppose that that part of the, I love one aspect of um, even teaching that I regretted was not having the company, of, I was a secondary student, yeah. not having the company that we had, you know, yeah. with, um, hundreds of children, you know, and teenagers, co ed boys and girls, brilliant books, you know, brilliant books. Yeah. I kind of missed that. And also, I was a teacher in English uh, up until 1993. But I don't think I ever got the chance to read a short story written by a child because it wasn't on the exam paper. Okay. Honours English, they didn't write fiction back then. And it was only the books were all about people who were dead. Um, it's not to say the work of the dead isn't worth reading, <laughs> but, I mean, but it was all, it was kind of. Here we were inviting people to really this incredibly creative work in the least creative way that was possible. Uh, it always left me feeling a bit angry. Um, when I left teaching, I'd written, I'd had, I was just about a fourth novel uh, published, but I wasn't able to give my experience to the kids because all I'd be doing is preparing them to believe in certain things as you can say, you know, something perverse about it always. So um, I thought just, you know, we open up the center and offer an alternative uh, point of work. Mm -hmm. So down in my day, I was the writer. He had opened up a different place in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. and it was magic, absolutely magic, watching a bunch of uh, Hispanic American kids writing a story like a story and all together. Mm -hmm. Really, really magic. And I thought, well, that was working well when we got to be more than it was in Britain. So um, that's, you know, I, I think my involvement in the words is a bit like being a grandfather. So teaching, you know, because I'm a man of father, you know, and you're stuck with these kids for a year, sometimes five years. The fighting words are more like a grandfather. I have their company for a couple of hours, and then they just pull them out. <laughs> <laughs> They're lovely people, you know. But it's, it's, it's a huge pleasure. Watching the work of people opening up and becoming better. And we do work in prisons as well, and that's yeah. a different thing. Uh, I say that, uh, I suppose, in a different, I'm using pleasure in a different way because it's never a pleasure to see people incarcerated. 
but to be in the companies is good and to see how their minds work. And uh, you know, you know, so I, I suppose the short answer is that uh, why the type of words that and why is it to keep going to keep the relationship. Yeah. 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 Great, thanks, Freddie. And for to keep an on that project being the um, I don't want to be found it, but when my day with this man, there seems to be a bit of an obsession, particularly in the media, around this idea of the young Irish being a writer is nearly becoming a genre in and of itself. I remember I was asked to contribute to a journalistic piece on the rise of the young Irish female writer, which I declined because my debut was I'm 40 when my baby published. And I'm not saying that 40 is old, but as a woman in her 40s with a day job and two young kids, I don't think I was the target by the who they're looking for in that particular mm -hmm. article. But at the same time, within publishing, when I was looking for a literary agent or when my book was being submitted to publisher, not once was I ever asked my age. So I'm just wondering, in a sort of long-winded way, have you noticed that as well? And do you think that age is a barrier to publishing, especially as a woman? Yeah, um, yeah my agent um, um, has a client who, uh, a short story writer called Jane Campbell, who had her first um, book published last year at 80. Uh, yeah, and um, she is an incredible writer, but she's a great old kid. And, she didn't even start to try writing until she was like 75, you know. <laughs> and these stories are unbelievable. I think that the options for film or TV or something, they're yeah. unreal. They haven't been published. They haven't published. It's called uh, Cat Brushing, I think, anyway. They're just mm -hmm. unbelievable stories. Yeah. So um, there's definitely not a barrier. Yeah. Nobody was interested in that at all. Yeah, um, yeah I, didn't, I didn't find it a barrier. I, and that thing, I think that's maybe something that it's uh, maybe feature writers for newspapers love all that sort of thing. It's like a marriage. I, don't, I really movie. didn't have any sense at all that yeah. um, the publishers cared about it. I also think that it's maybe not healthy to young women no, to be all lumped in together exactly. with that nonsense. Yeah. And, um, and then also, um, I don't know, some people got very annoyed on my behalf because when my short stories came out in 2021, um, lots of journalists wanted to talk about my age as if I, I was like the oldest person ever. Like, <laughs> you know, I was like, yeah, like I was, you know, I'm not a big chicken, but like Jesus, you yeah. know. Um, like lots of people start to go it's actually a lot of, you know, a lot of people just confess it, the chat to do it or whatever. And um, so that was ridiculous. But um, and so one of my friends was going mental over it. Um, but at the same time, I was getting messages from um, women my age and maybe older who were saying they found it very encouraging. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, that's why, yeah. you know. I've never been asked my age. Yeah. Now, there's another thing. Yeah. Somebody said that men don't get the no, 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 interested no. in that. I might now because I'm 65 very soon. So I might say, I'm the great for the age. But I'll this by yourself. So that's why I've so far in the world. I did a, um, I was asked to curate, to pick three new books by three new writers for a festival, to talk to the three new writers, three Irish writers, which is so Irish. Um, so, um, and I was asked, there's a little female came out, but I'll make sure one of them is a man. So it was almost like a flip. Yeah, there's, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. But I, I think it is probably, because of Sally Rooney, really, because yeah. of what is, you know, you get this all the new Sally Rooney. Really yeah. That's not what you're saying. No, no, no. It's almost an no, epic. It was for a while, the uh, new Rooney Boy, but that stops and it comes to do some of the yeah. else. You did that with Captain Tate as well, I think. Yeah. Yeah. These kind of 20 man voices from down the country. At the moment, I think it's a great time to be on Yeah. I suspect. And it's, um, but it's exactly as you said, it's sort of the publishing marketing machine or the publishing sales machine that try and box it into these little boxes. So yeah. whether it is like the, young, the next Sally Rooney or the next Sally Roddy or whoever it is, and you can find yourself a bit blaming if you don't fit into mm -hmm. one of those. But that's on the outside. From the inside, it's very different. Like as you said, Louise, there was never any men. Just just at all. Yes. Yes. You know, so. Well, I think as well that uh, a lot of it depends on, I mean, I think that, um, Readers, I suppose, it's not too well if readers connect with them. Yeah. But yeah. unless they get into the hands of readers, you have to hope in hell. And a lot yeah. of it depends on who's doing the PR yeah. and, um, and, and how well you work with them and, and just what opportunities they get. And some of it, unfortunately, does depend on hideous things like sales and marketing. Um, you know, because they have to try to get the stuff into the bookshops. Yeah. And if they don't sell, then they won't publish you again. Yeah. You yeah. know, it's that simple. You know, so yeah. a lot of that is, um, you, you know, there's kind of some very real stuff there about money. But, um, I'm not just up to find out. Yeah. Yeah. 
So the biggest issue you were saying earlier, Louise, that the only thing you can control is your book, it's the writing. Yeah, that's you, you, don't, you can't, you know, no, you can't absolutely you don't know that's going to have to do that. Probably jump in the gun. Yeah. 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 And if we if we get back then back to the writing again, um, would you mind talking a little bit about like what thread of things like words of the road back about your process? And do you have like a particular structure? Would you like to say, have you got um Japan and pen or chair or face or whatever. Yeah, I, I try. I mean, I, I was writing every day. It's just it, uh, because I've been in a go away and uh, a bit lately that I've tried it very hard. I, I went there, uh, I went to Australia and I got like a notebook and a laptop, so I'd write every day. And then all I did was just lie in bed trying to figure out what day it was. I don't want to go back to bed because I'm so tired. So that didn't happen. So, you know, uh, I, mean, I think I think Anna, Anna Enright says that. You know that maybe you should treat it like yoga, that the practice is just like your every day the way you do anything else. You know, like that in your life. Um, so I, um, I don't know. I, it's it's sort of hard to say because I have one of the stories and I have one not. So it's I don't know what it's going to be. Do you know what I mean? It's not like I have a thing that I know that I do all the time because the approach to the stories is probably very different. Yeah. Um, I didn't think I was writing the collection. Um, which probably helps a lot because if I had thought of what the amount of work was ahead of me, I just wouldn't have done it. Um, <laughs> So I just I have an idea for a story and I work on it and try and figure out a way to make it work. And then I would not so much finish it as um, I give up on it and then I move on to the another idea and keep going. And then I seem to have maybe you know a dozen or so stories that fit it together. Um, but with the stories, I was probably like because sometimes I didn't really know what I was trying to get at, but I'd uh, I'd maybe write a couple of pages. And because I didn't know how to move forward, I just edit and edit and edit those until they were like really tight and on the verge of like being really airless. And then I would force myself onto the next pages. But I think I knew with the novel that if I did that, it would just never happen. Yeah. So, yeah. so um, but I, I was sick and uh, I was off work. I was going to be off work for three months. And um, I spent about three days in the chair watching just, like Netflix and uh, I'd take a break and I just thought, like, you know, the chair and something. So I. Decided to try and write a novel um, in those three months. And uh, so the only two, I'm going to deal with myself to try and write a thousand words a day, um, which I already knew like, was probably going to happen, but it happens a lot of days. Mm -hmm. And to not look back at the absolute mad dribble that I've written the previous day, and just to try and push forward. Mm -hmm. and, and at the end of about 10 weeks, I had 64,000 words mm -hmm. of what could very charitably be called more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like a blog. <laughs> About this, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that's the process. But then uh, most of the work, I mean, that was three months of work, but it was like two years flat out of trying to fix up the max in yeah. the first draft. Mm -hmm. So I probably had nine drafts, I yeah. would say. Like we're all the way through. Yeah. 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 And it's interesting just hearing the different processes then between the different forms, between your short form and like, you have a little yeah. And do you find that as well, Roger? Then do you have different processes then for your different models? Really, yeah. Well, I suppose, yeah, I mean, different. Priorities into the world that they're doing a different job. Yeah, but it's, I, I tend to, I've always worked kind of Monday to Friday. The last nine, five or six, get the kids from home to school. And then I was a teacher when I was writing, so it didn't seem, it didn't seem to make sense to kind of work into the night. It felt a bit selfish, you know. Uh, so I always followed the same work routine as most other people. Much looser now with it because of the kids go to yeah. school. And um, I have an office in the city centre. I'm going there not every day, you know, I kind of drift in after the rush hour. And uh, I stay as long as I want. You know. I mooch around and we still wear a beautiful little niche. Get up and drop the pictures. Oh, yeah. and I come back and people, you know. So I'm looser with the time, but I use the time really well. But I'd be like very like Louise uh, when I'm writing a novel, try to get a thousand words a day. Yeah. Um, don't look at the quality of it too much, it's quality, quality, quality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then as you use the word journey, but you can get some things favorites. So, <laughs> if you were looking to call other people's work, <laughs> quite quietly yeah. yeah. call the only journey. That's called editing. <laughs> so I like when I've got enough words, I like air in the back. Mm -hmm. I like that. But, um, yeah, so it's uh, usually then, depending on the stage, I'm editing a book now at home, and it was really hard to leave it because it's a bit like juggling plates. 
or whatever, you know, the children and girl fashion children and girls who look like young so it's gonna fall. And uh, I was on the phone to the management, but I realized that actually it's not helping me need a bit of writing to hold in the plot and I had not <laughs> notes. So it's a bit like editing and writing at the same time. And I know I'm just at the point where I'm a bit past that and the rest is fine. <laughs> You're on the straight thing, <coughs> but uh, so it's tricky, it's a different kind of energy. Goes yeah. And what point do you show your uh graphs to your editor? Do you work very closely with them, or were they? I, I, I only recently got a, an agent. Okay. Um, what? And she, I, she's a brilliant reader, mm -hmm. unfinished work, so I give it to her. Okay, uh, and that's now for the last couple of years, yeah. And uh, then for different reasons, I, I give it to somebody very close, mm -hmm. and that's yeah. just uh, not even asking the question, I just feel I suppose you know the way you put a novel for people that is a long, long time before yeah. and I hate talking. Yeah. Somebody <laughs> says, Oh, what's it about? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the like, minute I start talking, it just feels so silence. Would you start to doubt yourself as well? Oh, yeah, I know that. I just thought you doubt yourself. Yeah, all the Horrible last text, so, you know, the cancerous things we carry, they're all energy. Yeah. 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 They're all energy. <laughs> in the right, in the right. And if you mentioned the grandmother that you use an office, do you think that's important to have an accepted space to home? Yeah. Because I, I, I mostly work in life from home. Yeah. And I still do work. Yeah. But uh, just when everybody was staying at home, I got out of the house. Yeah. And I saw the city open up again. So the office is on Dane Street, which is yeah. generally really, really busy. But I could walk out the door and straight across the street, and the knowledge that nothing was going to hit me. You know, this is nobody there. Yeah. It was really interesting. It's like, I felt like Will Smith in that film, you know? Oh, I am legend. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, small hours. The 20th century. It's an elderly man. Walking down. But uh, it was brilliant that to see the place open up. So that. Uh, I mean, it feeds into the work. Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. so and I'm lucky then. So at the moment, I have two offices, mm -hmm. and at the main one, again, I you know to make the job easier because you're totally isolated. I play music, you know, and uh, I'm a record player in the office. You know, uh, the only exercise I get when I'm working then is to walk three feet from my <laughs> chair to the record player to get over the record. <laughs> and what are you listening to at the moment then? Listen to you. <laughs> <laughs> not as an editor. <laughs> not just as an editor. I don't yeah. test myself. Yeah, that's like when you're doing your to have focus on us. And then just talk kind of well about uh, talk a bit about the double loading of the end of the office and everything. Um, and it's something that we've had after all the conversations so far about the pandemic and how it affected your creative practice or output. Um, did it change in any way? And has it had a lasting impact? I had a great point, I would say. Well, I, I kind of have a reference for like, maybe a month where I felt like I was treating the same light, light switch with Milton for <laughs> uh, in, in between um, looking at horrific things on my phone. and. Uh, and then, uh, and then, I don't know, I think maybe, I don't know what happens. I mean, because it, it just seems that it maybe was going to be forever. <laughs> and I just um, started working. So, because um, I, I have, think I was starting to move the third draft of the novel, and um, I really very little progress I've been making the first one because it was so bad that all, all the second draft it took about four months uh, was to, you know, decide on a fix on a tense and point of view and stuff like that, mm -hmm. and fix on the, the names and relations of the characters and so <laughs> because they were even changing it was so ridiculous and um so the third chapter is going to be a lot of work and then I think everyone just realized that I spent a lot of years reading short stories or something because I was writing short stories and um, so um because you couldn't see anybody I messaged a friend of mine and um and you know couldn't get into the libraries and I and they couldn't buy a book uh at that stage it was all a bit less busy so she left a bag of about 20 books on my doorstep and uh I moved into the spare room, chose the ones not to come near me, and um, I read about 17 books in about mm -hmm. three weeks, and then I went out. I have a little shed in the garden, and um, it sounds like it's traveling, but um, like it's a moment just full of water, like sometimes. But anyway, in the summer, it's like, and then. Um, oh, in your next book, there are mice. Yeah, I think it's more than mice. So, um, yeah, so I, um, I got so much work done. Now, it was really new work. Um, I, 
because maybe I don't know. I, I didn't write anything new, but uh, I um, reworked three stories that I thought were hopeless, and they ended up in collection. And uh, I remember they're still hopeless, but I got away with it. But um, and I I brought trespassing through maybe about four drafts, and I finished the BHC. I wrote some articles and stuff, and uh, I would absolutely love to be locked down again because I'd love to get another one. But I didn't write anything new. Like, maybe you need to be out of the world or something to do some new stuff. I don't know. 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 I about to be published, and that was responding. Uh, I kind of I was doing um, events that were organised by the agency for draft and work. So I was going to be doing a night, sort of an evening with Tommy Tiernan in the Cork Opera House, which is really looking for me, and Blind Boy in the mm -hmm. National Concert Club, really looking for both gone. But more importantly, kind of. I'd been away from the novel I was working on, and I opened it up, and it didn't make sense anymore because it was set in the present day, mm -hmm. but it's gone. Made and it was never coming back, you mm -hmm. know. So I, for the first time ever, I don't work. But I knew I was. How far are you going to get I think it was about ten thousand. Oh, I don't know. But a lot, you know, it yeah. was. I was especially if you thought you knew what you were doing with it, I thought it was all okay. Or well, yeah, I've never known too much about whether I was going to do it or not. It's kind of like a bit of a bit of a bit But I knew it was never going to be a And then I had a musical. The commitments were supposed to be doing it. That was postponed. The one that the mother really upset me, I've written a version of Peter Pan, so if you know that was that's going on now this Christmas. So three years <laughs> later, thank Christ. Yeah. And another thing that was Everything was gone, you know. So I thought then that I'd seen something in, I was in Newcastle the week before we went into lockdown. And the contrast between here and the UK was phenomenal, you know. I was being told that Dublin was shut, basically, that Newcastle was stag and men for centuries, yeah. you know, it was mayhem. And ordinarily, I could think of this as staying Friday night in Newcastle, but it seemed dangerous, yeah. you know. So I thought maybe there's a short story there. So I started writing and saying, you know what, this is probably good. I write short stories. But things are changing so quickly. Absolutely. And the language we were learning, you yeah. know, became common that we didn't know yeah. at the beginning of it. Now we, we carry those words for the rest yeah. of our lives. So I wrote short stories to keep going, and that was great. That got me up into the office and got me working yeah. on it. Yeah. It's a very powerful short story, you know. Um, oh, yeah. I came over in October 2020. Um, and I know it's the same for a lot of people. My father died that long after that short story. Um, and we weren't able to be there with him. Mm. And it's the role that nurses have to have done at that time. It's, yeah. it's that collective trauma. But particularly for nurses, the burden of it. And I'm just wondering because um, writing a short story and being able to that in the short form, um, whereas with a novel that the writer's the same, like that. Not being able to write about COVID or what was happening as we're living through it. So, just wondering what, what is it about the short form that allows us to explore that sort of current trauma that we can spread to each other? It's just about these writing yeah. about moments as opposed yeah. to somebody's life. You know, and I could, that, the nurse, the young nurse, yeah. she's very, very young, and there wouldn't be a novel in me about that young woman okay. because it's, she's too far away. Yeah. I've never captured it. Whereas I, I, I'm writing about a, a woman my own age at the moment. I feel very close. Yeah. You know, it's no problem. So I wouldn't be able to do it, but if I put on the blinkers and this kind of create blinkers and it's like it's just this moment that she's sitting at the table from home exhausted and she's recollecting her, her day and what she's experienced. And it was largely inspired by an RTE investigator, a prime time investigator so camera in uh A and the uh, uh, ICU board and from the yeah. It was brilliant, really, really moving and brilliant. The nurses in particular, yeah. you know, and putting on the full metal jacket every day, and you know, it was just brilliant. And the, the gentleness. Absolutely. Uh, so I just thought, well, if I can just capture a glimpse of the night. So that's the, that, if you like, the more of the short story. And somebody said, we're going to make a novel of it. It's not modesty, you yeah. know, but yeah. I, I'd never get close. You know. uh, oh, well, you captured it so perfectly. And I think as well, 
when, like that, in, in the pandemic, when people were reading, they didn't want to be reading about COVID in the novel, or, you know, they didn't want to be watching from TV, like a certain TV show, or certain introduced or certain, they want to be a faith of the novel. Whereas it's a short story, it's, it's that connection, that emotional, for it, as you go back in, that mm -hmm. moment in time, you know, which, yeah, it's probably been fed to be very kind of driving for waiting us. And if anyone has a bread, it's the uh, nurse definitely give it a read. Um, and then just talking then a bit about, so, like, what do you, the commitment for publishing AC Fed, is that right? So, right, yeah. how have you seen uh, the change in publishing really at that time? Um, has there been much of a change, do you think? Or? I suppose there has. Yeah. There's more of it in Ireland, that's for sure. The commitments, I published it myself, and I found out later was often described as vanity, which I think is You can just actually hear the people vanity, but, you know, the Twits have never had anything. So uh, it got a lot more attention, I suspect, than it might be today. This is a lot being published in Ireland, it's not fiction, it's not yeah. great stuff being published in Ireland. It's no longer the case of that. So it's changed in that way. But I don't keep I don't keep much of an eye on it to be honest with you. I just do my work and when I have a book ready, I give it to my agent. And she has a chat with you know my new publisher who's much younger than me, who's I'm old and retired. So uh, I don't have much interest in the purely publishing per se. And when somebody says, Oh, you must know such and such, I really don't know such and such, you know. So I think it would seem to me that there's a lot more being published. So the process for publishing for you hasn't changed in that time? It's um, we no, from my perspective, no. Yeah. But I'd say if you're talking to an agent who's been through, if you like, if, 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 if 1987 is what, 36 years ago? Mm -hmm. So if you're talking to, say, somebody with my, an agent with the equivalent mm -hmm. experience, for want of a better word, where or his answer might be entirely yeah, different. Yeah. But, uh, you know, essentially, I do exactly what I used to do, write. And I, I used to write longhand, but I got, you know, portable laptops, I had word process. It's like turf, you know, they used to throw turf into the back of the <laughs> Like an <laughs> aga. <laughs> look at that, so slow. You know, so slow. But uh, then I got, you know, so I kept looking at the technology in a way. But other than that, still, you know, just down the words, put yeah, down the yeah. words, judge them later, you know, yeah. judge them later. Two aspects of the job. Not so. so my job hasn't changed. And like both of you have been incredibly successful and um, various accolades and more than five of them. How did you go to write something new? After a huge massive success, did you get into your head as well? Distracted. Yeah. <clears throat> it kind of, it's a compliment. It's nice to be, it's nice to win in the world. But I think it's even it's, it's even more different or worse to the degree that you're involved in a film. <laughs> that there's a sense that people think they're public property somehow or other. And it, sometimes it's grand, sometimes it's nice, sometimes it's a bit nice. <laughs> but it's the blinkers again, you put on the blinkers again and you try to get back to work. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm writing a 13th novel at the yeah. moment. It's really, it gets no easier, you know. And that, in a way, is disturbing, but it's also kind of reassuring that I'm trying to come up with something new, something fresh, something that's worth reading. First, first of all, worth writing and then worth reading. So it gets no easier. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know if I can't remember the initial question. But I think it's great. It's nice to go to this. You know, it's enjoy. Yeah, I do enjoy it. Yeah. yeah, I do enjoy it. I mean, I, sometimes I mean, you get the opportunity to teach other people. Yeah. At a festival, sometimes you don't come to a festival and you don't know it. Mm. They, you know, they shut you off as quickly as they possibly yeah. can. You are really on a conveyor belt. In other places, it's brilliant. Mm -hmm. you, you, you end up having, you know, forming friendships. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that's like, you're not getting any work done. But I suppose it's a different aspect. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And it's just, it can be really nice. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I think it, you know, you don't want to think too much about the yeah. words of shortness. Because the last week was a half of the city of the division. 
uh, maybe, I don't know, um, I don't want to say pressure because, um, because, yes, I don't know, I mean, I guess there's always the third person. People don't think the next thing is shelter, just even not that they don't think it's just that it is going to be shelter. You know, <laughs> um, so I, I, I'm sort of trying to write another novel, and uh, I think what you said is very true. I just got pulled out for a few months, and there's just no point. I'm going to have to maybe start from scratch again. Yeah. I think I have a block of it, but the summer is a bit beyond it, and nothing. And maybe that's the time to do it because now uh, like I just feel like I'm very much out of it now, yeah. and, and I'm probably going to have to find another way in. And maybe that's okay, but uh, you know, but. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think I, I got up to about maybe hitting 30,000 words, uh, which meant that up until about 20,000 words, I would start to think, this is like the best idea of human history. Mm -hmm. And then I got up to that stage and it's like, you're actually ruining your own life. You know, you've been trying to make this work like it's just a disaster. It's like falling out of it, isn't it? And then you realize the person is falling I'll shut you. What's the favorite part about the job? And um, would you say? I think I really, I really like it. I know it was the first job, and I find that uh, very hard. Um, I'm just yeah. I, I, uh, I, was, I, I mean, it's not that I hate it or anything. I just think it's very hard. Uh, mm -hmm. But I love. Um, I think I really enjoy it when I go enjoy it when I get to about like the third, fourth job stage when uh, I don't know when it just. I think it, it gets less mucky with each draft, mm -hmm. and um, and you can see it. And then because it was the novel was the first time I'd ever worked with an editor, so she didn't. My agent saw it after maybe the fourth draft, and then my editor saw it after the fifth draft, um, and she had things to say, and it was really great to see it from her point of view. I think because I I like <clears throat> short stories, like, like I, I got kind of used to that. I'm not I, I, like they're not. I didn't find it easy at all. Actually, um, I found it very hard for the. But I think a novel is different, like it takes very big machinery to keep it all yeah, working. Yeah. And um, and it's quite hard to see that when yeah. you're you're also having to worry about you, you know paragraphs and sentences and chapters and things like that. <laughs> so um yeah, so it was really great to have somebody else come in and say, yeah. okay, this needs to be moved up to the front, or those two characters are performing the same function, so two which one are getting rid of, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. I like the options. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. You have to do the writing. Yeah, absolutely. You need something to edit. Yeah. Uh, the snapper, because I started that in 1986 and finished a few years later, and it's a short book. Uh, and I was teaching at the same time, yeah. and you know, there's a lot of living involved with it, so it wasn't just to sit on the desk. But the first draft was literally, literally twice the length. Um, mm -hmm. I wrote it in copy books, and I remember going through it, and there were characters that I didn't recall. They must have made sense when I say brought them into the kitchen. But I dropped them. And then they stopped existing after, say, page 27. And it, was, it wasn't that I lost interest in them or something, but I'd forgotten. So why. that's what so your attention that you went on the next day. Yeah. yeah. So you have to go back to them and just. You sort of take your own book in the big interesting to get to murder us. Yeah. But it was not to measure. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah the editing, the big, I like the big first edit, like you're really hacking away at the old, you know, the teaching, the red fire, yeah. you know, my sorrow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then the, the later edits, I think you get a bit of a sentence here in the front, way better. Or so you keep the words, and it's like, yeah, yeah, it's very nice to get that sentence. Yeah, that's really, that's really. Uh, yeah. And I don't, you see, I don't want to watch. I meant to borrow my husband for this. I have no idea time, but what I'll do is I'll ask one more question and then I'll open up to see if anybody wants to ask a question. Um, so, I think just to finish up, um, what would be your one piece of advice to give to writers? <laughs> Maybe, you know, make it as, you know, I think the idea of quantity before quality is really quite important because you can measure, it's easier to measure success. So, you know, at that point, you can, you know, if, you, if you're sitting writing and you just, you know, you've been there for hours and you realize you, you, know, you actually haven't gone to a new page, it's very hard mm -hmm. to find the momentum to come back the next day. Whereas in the early stages, you're just trying to, hey, like, folks, there's no coincidence. We're probably not the only people who try to get a thousand words. 
Mm-hmm. It's a good figure. Mm-hmm. You can feel you're coming for that. And it's three pages, so you do take yeah. along with it very, very quickly. Yeah. Very quickly, you're looking at, yeah. you, know, you know, maybe within a, you know, within a week, you've got 30 pages, or yeah. 30, 10 pages, or 30 pages, or whatever. Yeah. That's amazing. And mm-hmm. there is. So it does go down very quickly. In my head, when I hit page 50, I read the page and started writing more. Yeah. And I read that somewhere else, mm-hmm. somebody yeah. said the same thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a, a page measuring words is better than pages. So I write about the dialogue. That's only a couple of hundred pages, you're working pages. Yeah, between pages. Yeah. pages. Exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah. calm yourself. <laughs> this, we are calm ourselves. Yeah. But yeah. it is important. I make it very easy for myself by telling the news. So there are other things, but just to be kind to yourself and not be too. And I've, I've also I've seen people on Facebook talking what they did today. <laughs> I've done that. Okay. You know, obviously, if you're showing it to friends, the friends and families, but uh, you know, you're a bit you're and, and the often there's, you know, they, you know they, they say nice things about it. So you better not keep it to yourself, keep it to yourself. Try to be kind to yourself, that's all. Yeah. It's a rough, you know, I love it, but it's a rough, but uh, it can be rough. You know, you're on your own all the time. No one gives a shot. Really. You know, no one. Uh, that's right the top. So you have to pop yourself up and match. Okay. Um, but I think that um, maybe people should be reading at least as much as they're writing yeah. as well. And um, because I didn't write at all until I was 47, and um, if I knew anything at all, it was from what I've read. Mm-hmm. And um, because as readers, you don't just take a story, you're taking a structure, and somehow you're pretty, I don't know, that in some way you're seeing how things work. Um, and I think that's really, really important. But I, I, and I'd also say, um, I don't know. Uh, do you know what, after a while, I, I think that some people end up writers end up reading, not competitively, but maybe because they're curious of what other people are doing or something. Yeah. But it's, I, I'd say don't just read books that uh, have been published this year. And uh, like there have been books published for hundreds of years. Yeah. So read some of those too, you know, just read, and even nonfiction, like just read really widely yeah. because it all just goes in there. But I, yeah, um, and yeah, I don't like all the stuff, but yeah, just leave your phone at home, walk around with the fresh air. Yeah, find out the names of things, you know. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Well, thank you, Megan. So I'll open up now and see if anybody has any questions out there that they'd like to ask. Thank you. My question is for Rodney. Um, I just want to start by thanking you for thanking you for fighting words, which is such a wonderful enterprise. And the question is connected to that. So I wonder there's uh, that uh, divided um belief on our writers born or are they trained? So I wonder, is it possible to train people or is it a gift that writers have? And uh, can anyone write as a question? Yeah, anybody can write. Mm-hmm. Uh, all, the great thing about writing is that it costs nothing, really, mm-hmm. unlike other art. Mm-hmm. So we all own the words. So they're all there. The vast majority of people know how to put them on page. So I think uh in terms of quality i think there's a lot of people who never get around to discovering they can write because they're not trained to sit and do it so that, that kind of resilience isn't there a lot of people seem to think it's about wandering around at wbh uh wandering around public making the right word you know doesn't work that way, the same thing you were falling. But I think uh, a lot of people could write very well, and sometimes they might benefit from a bit of magic. People encouraging, uh, and showing them what really works. You know, I, I take huge pleasure if I'm reading something uh, by a, somebody who wants to write, and there's something like about the sentences that are really good. It's great to get the point about it. So, you know, that's really where it's great. You can almost use that as a template or keep going back to it to remind yourself that you can do that. You go back and forward and see if you can replicate that without so you can, you can help people along, but I suppose at heart, you need to you need to want to do it. 
you know, I've met so many people, oh, I don't have the time to write. And I know people with busy lives often, but I just have no time for it. So, you know, we can all say we want to write. And I certainly could have said I'm writing more than I you know, two children and a job. I still have time to write because I really want to do it. So, uh, but yeah, I think you can, you, ultimately it has to come from within. But you can certainly uh, encourage and, uh, you know, even sometimes it's a question of suggesting a book to people so that they can see the layout. Jennifer Johnson, the layout of Jennifer Johnson's pages. It's an awful lot to be learned from a writer point of view. Or Elmore Leonard, crime writer, leave aside the pleasure of reading them. You learn a lot just by the way they use the page and the, the, the wide open space, the white on the page. It's part of the process, it's part of the storytelling, you know, trusting the reader as well. So there's a lot you can, you can, you can help people like that. It has to come from the page. Um, Do you have that in your mind? I think it's 1982. I uh, met um, a producer from BBC, his name was Michael Waring, and he had produced a, uh, a series called Boys from the Black Stuff, which mm -hmm. people might know. Mm -hmm. So I was walking, you know, I was going into meeting in town on Sunday evening, myself and another you know, went up producing their television series, and I was walking from the guard station to the hotel he was staying, and I was thinking to myself, I was a bit in awe, and I was thinking, Jesus, I'm meeting the man who produced the post for that stuff. But I popped on after a while and said, Well, the reasons he leaves here because he wants to meet me. What will I do? So by the time I got to the hotel, I had this in my head four characters all to be sent to family father, one of the kids, one of the kids, and mother. They each would have their own episode. And I've been writing about it like an emotionally successful family and they made me to snap on the van. And I thought, well, the next door neighbors things aren't quite as functional. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a bit rougher. And I know the, the dad is probably the agent of a lot of the figures making, so he is the first guest. So by the time I got to meet Michael, I was suggesting this thing. Each episode I had the, you know, its own soundtrack reflecting the age and the taste of the character, its own look, even though they're all living in the second house. And its own personality because you're talking to different characters. So uh, I ended up writing this four part series for BBC broadcast in 1994. And as I was writing the last episode, which was Paula and the wife, I began to wonder more about it. They wrote me the second few months in 1993. And I began to wonder, you know, uh, what happens now? You know, and also, you know, what was she like when she was younger? What was it about him that she liked? Why did she fall in love with this group? What was it about? You know, to justify her life as well. But I'm sure, but I know that an awful lot of women have been in bad, bad relationships are asked, so why did you know? You know, you know it, it, it's in some ways a reasonable question, but it's, it seems to be throwing blame. You know, if you had a bit of problem, it would have been hard to You know, so I just thought that, you know, and I could imagine her sitting at the table and writing this. You know, the notion that he was a chauvinist. You know, I could see her sitting down writing, much the same as I used to, you know, understanding the story. But so, gradually, that's what it is. So, in a way, it's unusual because usually it's the book followed by the telly, but in this case, it's the telly followed by the book. And then I thought, years later, I wonder what she's doing. You know, unlike other characters, when they're gone, they're gone, and she's always just sort of overhyping at the moment and her again. It's very thoughtful. Yeah. She's she's 67. So yeah, she's always popped up. And, uh, you know, I thought when the boom was on in Ireland, I thought the fall would be a good, you know, guy to be not about writing something semi-satirical about money and property, you know, you know, it's not I'm not interested in money. That's <laughs> not the best I certainly have no interest in property. And there's nothing to get me out of the room quicker than two dog shells talking about the price of houses <laughs> 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 the most awful, boring, but you, you 
having a coffee with people sometimes, and you realize, oh, it's you know, all of us. They sit up because they're talking about our house. <laughs> and they just want to talk, you know. So, but <laughs> now, well, the story with this one, you know, one talk about most of the start, on the day she gets her first vaccination. Mm -hmm. So it's post, mm -hmm. a little bit post. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, there you go, there you go. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Question for Louis. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm just interested how you talk about. You just had an idea for the story. Like, how do you do the ideas come to you when you're writing? Do they come to you outside of writing? How do you know it's an idea for a story or a novel or uh, an idea from well, uh, uh, So I think with that book, um, the very first thing that I wrote for Trespasses had absolutely nothing to do with the novel, and that's the I was getting mixed up between it's the the prologue is the bit to start. And uh, that's how I was an exercise that I did on my MA when um, we were sent next door to the Ulster Museum to find um, an exhibit or a piece of art uh, to, to write about. And it was at the tail end of the Art of the Trouble exhibition. And uh, um, so I wrote something. And actually, some of the sentences are in there completely untouched in that we prologue. And um, at the same time, there was a slightly about writer called Bettina Sykes, who made these uh, pieces of sculpture that she called Ghosts. To commemorate um the you know the centenary of 1916 and they were placed in various you know locations around the side of the courthouse and one of them was sitting in the snuggle pond the family pub they like to kind of great but um they look really kind of I don't know kind of ethereal and, and gaudy but when you touch them they're like stone cold and uh, so I think it maybe I don't know I think that maybe somehow that got me thinking about um I, I, I think maybe a character was formed in my head or something that maybe this I imagine this piece of sculpture, you know, um, that that has been made, you know, in memory of of of, of, of somebody who was a, a, a casualty of the troubles. But actually, I think Cushion, who's the main character, has been um, kind of bothering me for for years. And um, I wrote, I had to write a play in my MA. Um, it was I, I hope that nobody ever sees it. But it was <laughs> set in a, it was very bad. And, but it was set in a bar, um, in the in the north in the seventies. And um, it was probably the same opening, uh, which is like, you know, a man walks into a bar and there's this very bored uh, woman, you know, no one's be behind the bar. And uh, and he turns out not quite what he, what he, you know, she thinks. And then in uh, this story in Silhouette, that was really lucky for me, that opened in a bar as well um, uh, during the trouble. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think that maybe the character was written more than the story or something. Yeah. Question for both Louise and Robbie. Do you both tend to write in the same genre the whole time, or do you like to burst out and do something occasionally, or would your agents try to push you back into a box if you did try to escape from your genre? Um, or else <laughs> you <laughs> they to do Yeah, they, they wouldn't. Oh, my agent or anybody I know would never say, probably they stop that. Um, I've always been a free agent myself, so to speak, I can do what I want. Uh, I wrote a book recently, or the last year, with Kelly Hearn, to be my boss. Mm -hmm. It's a great experience, but my agent, you know, she had no, she'd never done anything like that, you know, these co written books. And we had a lot of, we, we laughed a lot, you know, she's talking about the negotiation, but um, how, you met, how these things are measured. As opposed to how they're normally measured in the world of literature. But she never for a second suggests, I don't think we should do this. Um, and anyway, she probably knew when I want to do something creative, I want to do it. And it's not about how I'm perceived or anything like that. So nobody's ever said that she, it'll always be, if a gun was put to me head, I, I, and you were told you can only write one thing for the rest of your life, you can all be said. And uh, nobody's ever told me you should. It's a good feeling sometimes. I oh, yeah, I'd like to have a match. You know, and I could say to you now, and it's the way I feel, I probably only write prose from now on. But then I might see, meet somebody, or I might get a phone call, you'd be driving home today, and somebody would say, you have an idea for a play, and they tell me what it is. I would say, oh, yeah, go out there again. You know, the energy. 
if, if the energy is there, yeah, don't, I, I died. And I probably would never write for children again because I stopped reading that. The energy went when the children were too old. Mm -hmm. I don't have grandchildren, and I'm not going to suggest to the children that they steal the house match. I don't think it's good for no reason to put your kids on the carpet. But I, you know, grandkids in the abstract seems like a nice idea, but I'm quite happy not to have any. You know, so, um, and there are other things I probably won't do again, but I probably won't do an opera again because Jesus has a hard work, but bring him to do it the first time, especially the first rehearsal, where all the, the you know, unlike stage rehearsals they all came and they knew they just started singing you know whereas usually the first day of rehearsals it's a mess they just started singing the guys started playing the piano and all these people started singing and you know it's marvelous mm -hmm. brilliant brilliant but i don't think i'd do it yet we just have time for one more question here yes hi um with many of our views um in your um you mentioned that in sort of the ending phase, four draft four or five or seen by your agent or your editor. Can you, what happens between draft one and five? Or talk a little bit about the editing process. Well, because well, so this is what I did with with trespass because I don't really want to talk about any. So, um, I um, yeah, the, the draft, I did the first draft very quickly. The second draft took eight ages to fix all the mistakes from that was of the first draft. The third draft, um. I mean, probably because I go literally from I was going literally from start to finish. As I was going along, I was cleaning up the rising, um, and that just got cleaner and tighter because of the way that I did it as I went along. Um, but I think maybe something happened with the third draft that I was looking at um, a block of by that stage maybe seventy five thousand words, um, and it it still looked, I I could see how much work there was to be done, and I think um, to uh, to make it look less awful, I I broke it into five sections. And I worked on like one of those, you know, and then I'd work on the next one, then I'd work on the next. And they seem to take on maybe a life of their own or something. And what I had intended to do is to just, you know, line them all up together. Um, but they something seems to have happened when I worked on each each section and, and, and they each got a, a, a kind of a, I mean, each, each section got a title in the book. Yeah, I don't know. Um yeah, so I think that you know the maybe I was doing line ups the whole way through or something like that. Yeah, and um, the reason I didn't show it to my editor for a long time was because I was, or, or my agent, was, uh, because it looked, it still looked about as if I she dropped me. And um, I also wanted her to see it before I sent it, um, before my um, editor in Bloomsbury saw it in case she uh, took me lunch or something, like, <laughs> or asked me to start writing another book because I couldn't, it just still seemed like a mess, and I, I couldn't, uh, I just couldn't see, you know, the way, whether it was any way decent or not. You know, I just couldn't see that. So, yeah. Okay, one more in there. <laughs> just in relation to editing and drafting, kind of around that story. But um, have any of you, both of you, got experiences of sensitivity readers that their that publishers are now applying? And if so, I mean, in case of do you think commitments ever will be published to sensitivity readers out there? Well, the I was writing the right. commitments today would be quite different because the circumstances are in this very different place. So. The famous line, you know, aren't the Irish and Blacks of Europe? I wouldn't write it, not because I think it's inappropriate, because it makes no sense. Mm -hmm. The country is one of the richest countries in the world, and the band, more than likely, given it's the north, northeast of Dublin, would have members whose you know, ethnic origins are from, from, from all the islands, you know. There would be, you know, black members of the band, and other, you know, people who don't necessarily have an end of the North Union. So it would be very, very different. So, uh, no, I haven't encountered sensitivity. I've, I've encountered kind of harsh reactions to my head. And I, you know, including most recently the commitments because it's touring. Mm -hmm. but people with a bit of cop on realize, in a sense, it's historical because it's set 36 years ago. And the snapper, the Sharon's encounter, for, you know, the polite in you know, the audience with uh, George Burgess and uh, by today's law that would be rape mm -hmm. but it wasn't mm -hmm. back then and the story is all about Sharon taking command of her own life so it's important that he become you know he's living because she makes mm -hmm. him mm -hmm. yeah. you know so uh the sensitivity that I haven't I, think I, I haven't been found to which I, I would you know I think every line is open to negotiation 
but it has to be the whole solution. You know, so you have read, you know, we've read the ones that go by more recently, but then some changes to Enid Lighten, and some of them are, you know, some of them you can see the point, others are just that, absolutely that, you know, seems that you're taking out a sentence because the word black is no context, you know. So, yeah, every line is a negotiation, but I think, you know, uh, you got, it's, it's somebody objected to uh, the line the Irish and Blacks of Europe, but there's drunkenness on the stage as well. Nobody objected to that. Yeah, I think, I, I think yeah, there's maybe something about it. If, that's, if it's used in a line of dialogue, uh, you know, uh, or something, that it may be different because if it's a character who's already been accused of ironically, yeah. uh, then it's not the same as, you know, this is rather dull view of the world, you know, it yeah. makes lots of And it, it is a sort of thing, yes. It's not something, to be honest with you, it's not something that worries me at all. Uh, and you know, part of the, our job, you know, they part in part, you know, is to give offense. You're always going to offend somebody. It's absolutely my near existence offends people. No, 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 you know, for probably wouldn't be a very good sensitivity reading. Yeah. The book wouldn't be published at all. Imagine what he's been reading on the white paper like that. Should have bothered. Oh, that gets me. But just again, around that, do you think the sensitivity reading? I'm sorry, I, I'm a former bookseller, so sensitivity readers then it, it's it seems to me like a form of censorship in some form. Yeah, of, I that's why I'm, again I haven't really all. Of, well, I think a lot of the things I've read about are tabloidy and sensitivity reader itself. It's not a job description of which really want myself to do. What to do? But I want sensitivity, and I've read that's lovely. You know, it's not something that doesn't make you sit up and go, ooh, that's a great job. But actually, I think that probably might be, it could be just a different form of editing, not necessarily. Yeah. The examples we hear about are just stupid. Yeah. You know, yeah. but there could be good, very, very good work going on. But if, if somebody said your mind is sensitive to either, I think that's probably what I need. Mean. Yeah. Can we, you know, can we talk about what's going to happen? And can I, can we make sure that I'm still in control of this? And then I've got no problem. It's just if it's a new element of the editing process, grand. But if they come back and say, oh, that character can't say that because he offends me. Well, you know, people offend other people all the time. So, or they say they clean up the language. But nobody has ever, ever, ever suggested that. Uh, good. And I think in different places they have different priorities as well as yeah. they get bothered about. Like um, uh, a lot of young American women have come after me saying that are absolutely filthy and disgusting and the 24 year old is with uh, an older man. Whereas um, I had a lunch in the parlor yesterday and the first thing was fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they get all like, of course you've had an old parent with the young woman. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're encouraging young readers, you know, it's all these young readers, you're encouraging bad, you're a bad role model, encouraging young readers to smoke. But I don't think that's what we were talking about. But, you know, again, it, it's not something I would personally agree with. Well, I think our time is almost up, so I'm going to leave it there. And you for being so generous with your time and your knowledge and your expertise and your craft. So thank you very much.